Hi everyone. Um, so what I thought was, uh, I, I thought I'd use some of the earlier talks and, and, and the information on the pigments and the evolution of those and see, sort of put it in a context as far as exoplanets are concerned to see if we could detect these signatures remotely and what, is, what are the challenges in terms of the wavelengths we would need to sort of prioritize or um, you know, uh, taking into account on the, the atmosphere and the cloud effects. Um, so I'll start with um, this, this plot that I came across a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, based on the Trappist, Trappist system. You know, um, it was detected uh, a couple of months ago, um, the star being about 40 light years away. And three planets happen to lie in the so-called habitable zone. And what, what we see here are density curves from Zen et al, which shows, you know, um, which shows what if a planet is made up of different kinds of materials, like a pure water world or a pure iron world, you know, where would, where would the planets form, fall in terms of density curves? And what we see already here is, although these are initial estimates, recent uh, work carried out on, the, on this front show that these planets might have large amounts of water that could be on, on the surface. So I was curious in terms of what if we detect water, water worlds? Can we have, can these planets be potentially habitable? And if so is the case, can we detect d differences between a purely water world and a water world that has some sort of biota on it, be it you know, photosynthetic organisms like algae, for instance? Or, and can we distinguish between these different algal communities? Algae are known to form large bio biological structures on Earth and can be easily detected with high resolution uh, spacecraft images. And, and they contain a diversity of pigments. So most of the pigments that, um, that Shil mentioned or Nikki mentioned in their earlier talks, uh, these, these are very commonly found in phot photosynthetic algae and they usually carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. So you might not see pigments like bacterial chlorophyll, which go outward in the infrared, but you see a range of chlorophyll pigments and accessory pigments, which I will come to in a bit. So one of the things we did a couple of years ago, and if, if you haven't come across some of this work, is we sort of uh, isolated a range of organisms, both photosynthetic and uh, non-photosynthetic organisms, to see how the spectral signatures for a diversity of pigmentation types would look like not just for organisms that live in extremes, but for organisms that encompass both the extreme and the niche environments. And, uh, and uh, these, these can be accessed at that uh, website here. It's hosted at Cornell, but um, these are hemispherical measurements, which means that they sort of give you the disintegrated reflectance spectrum for uh, an organism. And the, the whole spectrum goes from around 0.35 microns all the way through the near infrared 2.5 micron band. Um, so what we did here was uh, we measured about 137 uh, organisms containing a range of pigments, but uh, I'd like to use a subset of those um, for this particular talk. So I considered uh, about, you know, about 16 to 16 algal communities containing a diversity of pigmentation. And what you can see here is that algae are very uh, sort of uh, 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 polyphyletic in the sense that you can, it's, distinct, it's challenging to put a particular al uh, a microorganism or, or, or algae or an organism in a particular algal band based on phylogeny. You could have uh, different classes of organisms in the same algal, uh, algal uh, division, or you could have uh, organisms which belong to the same phylogeny that belong to different algae. Um, so usually, algae are sort of distinguished based on their pigmentation types. And uh, the, the range of pigments that these organisms have are, is either evolution specific or depends on the radiation that is available to these organisms. Um, the other thing is that the absorption of these pigments depends on the individ individual pigment as well as the chemical environment in, it, in which it's found. So you might have the same pigment but it might be in different chemical environments, so the absorption sort of shifts at times because of those reasons. Um, so here's a plot between a reflectance and wavelength in the two mic from 0.4 all the way to two microns. And what we see here is that 
um, a good example would be this: the the the, the, the uh, diagram, the plot in the towards the bottom, the last three ones, and all of them are red algae. You know, it looks green, pink, and red, but they have the same pigments. The difference is that usually, for red algae, for instance, you know, cycloerythrin or cycle phycocyanin, these are on top of the chlorophyll pigments. And the abundance of those pigments, these accessory pigments, so they help in, you know, they help in photosynthesis, but they also help in oxidative damage prevention. And the abundance of that will decide what the pig color would look like. If there's a lot of those accessory pigments, then the algae tend to look red in color. But a lack of them would uh, give you a greenish color then, because then that the chlorophyll pigments show up. Um, what, is, what you also see is that most of the um, organisms look quite similar in the infra near infrared bands because most of them have similar water absorption bands, which is probably due to the water of hydration, uh, both in its free and bound states. But if you go to the visible band, then that's when you see differences in these uh, pigment absorption ranges. What I'd like to do then is we took some of these organisms and we started, we, we used um, um, exoplanet atmospheric code called exoprime, which is a one-dimensional coupled radiative transfer code, uh, which takes into account the stellar and planetary uh, parameters and calculates the reflection, transmission, and emission spectrum for a planet. The code in turn consists of a one-dimensional climate code, a one-dimensional photochemistry code, and a one-dimensional radiative transfer code. What we started off initially doing is, uh, like the previous talk that Jack mentioned, we, we, covered, we covered an entire surface with a particular organism to, to get a sense of the general detectability and the surface signal strength. So we know what, what's the strength at its maximum peak. And then we started um, incorporating other, other surfaces. So we tried uh, including, uh, we played, started uh, exploring the parameter space for water then to see how these signatures would change if you were to have a lesser fraction of the biota when compared to the water fraction that's covering in the ocean. We also played around with the parameterization for clouds to see how clouds would either help or um, you know, sort of hide these features from remote detection. And um, so here's a plot of, um, it looks complicated, but I'll make it a little, um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this in a while. So basically in the infrared portion, so if you look at 1.0 micron to 2 microns, all the features look the same. And these are primarily because of these water absorption bands and the atmospheric effects to a certain extent. And so it's very difficult to probe through the surface in these conditions. So if I look in the visible then, then that's when um, surface features start to sort of come up. So here we have in the blue color, like right at the bottom, that's a planet that's 100% completely covered by oceans. And then I started playing around with the surfaces. So I started increasing the surface coverage, so 10, 30, 50, 70, and 100. And you see that obviously for 100, you see more of the pigment, character, pigment absorption and the pigment properties as opposed to um, having some, somewhere between, you know, some, something like 10% would, where you have a 10% biota and a 90% water surface, detection of these pigments becomes extremely challenging, if, if not impossible. The other thing I did then was I tried to play around with the, with the cloud fraction. And again, the same thing happens as before. Clouds sort of have a very high reflectivity, and clouds by itself have close to 90% reflectivity, and they try to, they, 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 they hide all the surface and atmospheric features. And, and that's what we see here. But if I go in the visible again, and if I go from you know, a completely 0% cloud coverage to 90% cloud coverage, I see that all the surface, fraction, surface features tend to sort of disappear at about 60 to 70% cloud fraction. So we want something that we need clouds. We do need clouds because that helps in raising the signal. So it's easier to detect because if you have a completely ocean world like the one in the blue, then you're getting an albedo of close to 0 0.1, which or 0 0.04 in fact, which is which means that if you're looking at the planet, the planet is going to look very very dark. So you're not going to get any signal. You want these photons from the planet. So um, so you know these clouds will help get you an increase in signal, but at the same time you don't want them to be overshadowing the complete atmosphere. 
So, um, so, so a mix somewhere between uh, you know 40 to 60 percent cloud, uh, 60 percent looks as the optimum band for these um, surface feature detection. And um, yeah, so I'll stop there by saying that you know surface features look are best detectable in the 0.4 to 0.8 micron band um, with with a surface coverage of greater than 30 percent and a cloud fraction of less than 60 percent. Um, the new future instruments like the GMT Seacliff, which is on board, it's a spectrograph on board the GMT that's due to come on in 2024, including other space missions like WFIRST and Loop War, which probably will have these capabilities and for detecting such signatures for habitability and life. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Hi, uh, René Heller, Max Hi, Planck Ray. Institute for Solar System Research in Göttingen, Germany. Uh, my question, I, I'm a bit confused about the aspect of cloud coverage. Um, I would guess that if you have more clouds than what you see, yeah, of course you get more photons, but they wouldn't have anything to do with the bacteria that are below the clouds because they are just reflected stellar light. So could you walk me through as to why your signal of the bacteria that are on the surface should actually increase if you have more cloud coverage. No, 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 the cloud coverage, I think I'm, um, uh, the cloud coverage would increase just because the cloud reflect a lot more light. The bacteria would decrease the signal um, because the albedo, the reflectance factor for bacteria are le le much lower than that. So the net integrated would be less than what you would have if you were to have just clouds by itself. Does that make sense? Uh, Sean Domingo Goldman, NASA Goddard. Uh, so, uh, in theory, if I'm interested in building a space telescope to look for signs of life, um, would you have any advice in terms of not just the wavelengths but the spectral resolution? Yeah. So we played around. We we calculated those as well. Um, we we try. We've been calculating the spectral resolution for uh, JWST. In the, I know JWST starts in 0.6, and it the it claims to have a spectral resolution of 150 uh, for the visible. And uh, 150 was, we could still see significant uh, pigment absorption um, lines uh, in the visible band. So I, I would guess 150 is good enough as well. So 150 is sufficient, but, um, but you don't know what the, what the cutoff would be for detecting or not. Is that? Is that yes. Right? So I met with uh, Mercedes Lop uh, Lopez at the CFA um, in, in San Francisco for the breakthrough meeting this, uh, this last week. I was with Jack at San Francisco. And I spoke to her about the GMT C cliff as well to ask her what the resolution for the GMT would be. Um, she gave me a couple of white papers, but uh, she, she, the th they, they still don't have the final numbers on that yet. But uh, if that's the case, I would be interested in looking what, what the resolution for that and calculating for those as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you very much.